Hello, I'm Joan Lipkin, and I am the co-chair of the ATHA Award for uh, Leadership in Community-Based Theater and Civic Engagement. I am so pleased to be here with you today via Zoom with Marty Pottinger. Marty Pottinger is a nationally respected and beloved leader in the community, arts, and creative placemaking field, really since the 1970s. She is a playwright, performer, and director, and won an OB for City Water Tunnel Number no. Three. She's also the executive artistic director of Art at Work, which is now based in South Portland, Maine. We are so pleased, Marty, to recognize your contributions to our field with our annual Leadership in Community Theater and Civic Engagement Award. So, thank um, you, John. You're thank so welcome. Thank you to the committee, and. Uh, I, it makes a big difference. Uh, I appreciate it. Well, we appreciate you. And I'm really pleased that we're gonna be able to share more about your work with a wider audience because of the accessibility you know, of our technology. Um, so um, I'm just gonna ask a couple of questions and we'll sort of see where we go. Uh, I think what I wanna start with is a recognition that these are very challenging times, right? politically, economically, uh, spiritually, um, uh, culturally, in terms of climate, all of it, right? What encouragement can you offer us about what artists and cultural workers might offer in this very pivotal moment? Uh, <laughs> I'm coming up on my 50th year of, uh, of doing this work and I'd say I have a basket full of encouragements um, starting with I am hopeful I am in despair and both of those two things keep the edge very sharp um, I find a real battle in not settling for numb comfort. Uh, that's the challenge, you know, whatever lies ahead. Uh, and I said this to my nieces and nephews when they were quite young, I'm grateful to be alive during this particular time when uh, I believe we're facing the first planet-wide crisis that involves humans. Um, and never have we been more connected, and certainly that has brought a lot of issues and problems at the same time. Uh, but how thrilling, however it turns out, to be alive and engaged and working all that's happening around the world uh, in theater, in the arts, uh, in uh, climate preservation, uh, and environmental species preservation, it's a pretty big deal. So I also see this crisis as involving a planet-wide transformation for social justice, for positive ends, that the only way I see us figuring out how to really turn the tide is to actually figure out ways that a lot of the oppressions are resolved that racial justice and sexism and gender justice all that gets sorted out as well um this crisis reminds me of some of the ways that theater works it and art making it makes it requires that we take risks and that we find the courage to kind of step towards our fear and towards the unknown um and i see one of the big issues is Comfort is actually uh, a threat. It's so understandable. I mean, you see little kids do it too, but uh, from this work, instead of comfort from digging theater work, I found joy, I found inspiration, I found uh, it's being scary. Uh, and I've never found comfort in making art or being an artist, uh, working with people. So, uh, I do think that we've got making art where I've kind of put my attention the last almost 50 years. Uh, 
it's strategically engaging people's creativity it, that it causes things to become possible that would not have been possible uh, otherwise. Uh, one of the things in 1987, I'd stopped performing for 10 years and I have an erratic education, um, kind of an, as much an education in life as anything formal, but I learned that, I kind of got it, that dictators when totalitarian regimes, when they're seizing power, and I had never thought of this before, they go after to control the military and they go after the artists. Yeah. And it was that new clarity back then. I'd been living and spending my time as an activist in lots of different ways that I realized they understood how powerful art is in ways that I didn't. And that's when I realized I actually could anchor the rest of my life um, kind of on the, the landscape of art making or in the world of art making. Um, Yes, I think, and I know, uh, and I know that you did a TED talk, and that you did, um, you came up with a, an interesting list of five outcomes of creativity, and I was wondering if you might share those with us. Yes, uh, that here I've been working with non people who, for the most part, don't identify as artists. Thousands of people, <laughs> thousands. And having them create art as part of the experience that we're sharing, but to better understand economic inequity, to better understand themselves and money, to better understand racism and lots of stuff. So I tried to think what are the five reliable impacts or outcomes of people acting in a creative fashion. The language doesn't really support the reality yet, I don't think, creative engagement, creativity. But anyway, the first is it accesses in each of us a flexible intelligence that often lies fallow. A flexible intelligence, which is very different. Um, it activates, second is it activates our imagination. It allows us to imagine things that aren't in existence, that aren't there, and if we choose to actually bring them into existence. It allows us to, and this is very important in these times, I feel, it allows us to recognize, acknowledge, and hold contradictions, and not just the contradictions for other people, but our own contradictions as well. And I think that's mm -hmm. very key to anchoring ourselves in a place that allows the kind of engagement with each other that would make a big difference. And then it awakens uh, what I call a rational hope. I grew up Protestant, so I was surrounded a bit by a cheery hope, a cheerfulness, a kind of like something that isn't quite the inherent hopefulness that I think you see in young people. And lastly, for me, the fifth thing was most significantly that making art uh, requires that we take risks, that we find the courage to walk towards what scares us, towards the unknown, uh, and to take the kinds of risks that actually lead to new ideas, to uh, transformation. So those were the five things. That's fantastic. And I think that if you follow these as a kind of path, right, that it really can lead to radical transformation. And it's very helpful in working with people who don't necessarily have experience or identify as being in the arts, right? Oh, my gosh. Right? People were so scared when I'd say we're going to make a poem. I mean, yeah. <laughs> yes. there's... There's just, when I said, we're going to, I told them when I was working with the neighborhood associations, we're going to sing next time. And they're like, sing? I said, don't tell anyone you're inviting to join us that we're going to sing. Don't promise me you won't say it. And um, it was that, it's that, we need to be that brave in, in many places as well as making art. Yes, absolutely. Um, this is great. <laughs> I really appreciate everything you're sharing. So, you know, you have had a very full and still active career. Uh, and there's so many things that we could talk about, but I'm wondering, Marty, if there are one or two projects that really stick out as pivotal um, in your experience and, and why. I think I'm, <laughs> I'm gonna cheat the tiniest bit on this. I'm just gonna say before, I, I do have two thoughts. I want to say uh, I've done over 15, you know, an art at work has done over 15 projects here in, in Maine alone. Uh, 
two poetry calendars and a performance, two original performances, one with police officers, one with African-born high school students after a fatal police shooting in Portland, a comic book project with veterans uh, in Maine National Guard who served in Iraq and Afghanistan, um, working with uh, a print carving project and story project with public works. There were a lot of uh, racial discrimination suits. And so we did a, a project of carving things and telling stories about their kind of reclaiming their own actual ethnic heritage and weakening their identity as being white um, in a way to address the, the racism. Um, and then a year-long multi, uh, multidisciplinary art project with four neighborhood associations to help build the skills, the interest, and the ability to bring and do inclusion and diversity and equity in their membership. It was, all were very segregated by class, by race, by national origin and uh, age so that all that okay but those weren't the two projects i'm thinking of um the mm. two projects i'm thinking of one is city water tunnel uh which you mentioned in the intro that got the ob and it was a three-year project and i would say almost all my projects are they're projects that include a performance right and so not only getting the ob word but also in the opening night performance i had to figure out a way Joan, to get the miners, the sand hogs, to come. I mean, they did not want to come to it. They wouldn't even come to Chelsea neighborhood, right? I mean, you got to be kidding me. Their schedules, they're driving hours every day just to get to work from 4 a.m. to, you know, 6.30 a.m. and then back home. There's just so many challenges. But I figured out to opening night should be a benefit because they needed enough time to then tell the other people their colleagues, that it was actually worth seeing or not, right? That was the risk. Here's this one woman show about what they've been working on and what their fathers worked on and what their grandfathers. And then it's not just one woman, it's me, not a traditional woman necessarily in everyone's picture. And so we made it a, a, a benefit. And instead of ch making it free or anything, we charged $100 a ticket and we raised $20,000 for a memorial. Um, just in that one night and the word went out and from then on for the entire two-week run of dance theater workshop we had sand hogs there and their families and it just changed everything and at the end they would come up I would invite them up after the show and then they would we would sit together in front of everybody and everybody would just ply them with questions so I wasn't gonna get into all that it's it's you know a yes I do love these memories but anyway, but this show had original score. It had video installations, on-site performances at the Hog House on the construction site, at the Department of Environmental Protection. It had a, we had a weekend, I think we had two weekend fairs where they brought their families and the Department of Environmental employees got to meet the sand dogs and the sand dogs and this. Photography exhibits, a memorial to the workers who had died. And uh, in the midst of... You know, New York was going through a really hard time. I think this is like 93. I mean, New York is often going through a hard time. In the midst of 90, I think we started in 93, and it kind of, the last run in New York, the third run in New York was 98. Um, so after here and after Dance Theater Workshop. But anyway, I wanted to create a performance where New Yorkers could find or remember the common ground we all share. That was my interest. All my work has goals and reasons. Uh, metaphorically, through our connections to water, the fact that we're mostly made out of water, we drink the water, it comes out of the faucet, and that's what this tunnel is bringing, but also practically to each other, kind of remind us of our common shared ground practically is we're residents, we're water drinkers, we're taxpayers, we're working people. And even today, what is that, like 20, over 20 years ago, that show? Even today, people will reach out and just say, I have never turned the faucet on without thinking about where that water comes from and who makes it possible. So um, I wanted to communicate the value of working class people and the work they do in a way that, that the, the working people themselves, their families who came and saw the show 
and the audience just never, never lost track of, just remembered. And uh, I wanted to bring, another goal was to bring them together. I kind of mentioned they didn't know each other. There was a video, on Mary Ellen Strom did an on-site video at the DEP in the Hog House, beautiful video where they, for the first time, these office workers who'd worked 20, 30 years on this and the construction workers, it's a 60 year long project, right? And they got to see it and they got to see it with beautiful music by Steve Elson, a part of the original score. And they got to hear interviews that I did with each of them. It was so powerful. And this is all on the internet, uh, all at art at work. US. So there were about 28 goals, if I remember correctly, and they're they're lookable. They're in the book Citizen Artist, I hope, and they're also online. So it was my first multi-year project that I did, and it was the first one we raised a quarter million dollars. Um, all my previous performances before that I paid for myself out of money I'd earned as a carpenter. And uh, that show had three New York City runs toured at least 15 cities in the U.S. It had another four in Europe. It won the OB, which may, meant a lot, obviously. Um, someone who's kind of like an, in, an outsider in ways to many things. And uh, for my first visit to the Hog House on 10th Avenue in Manhattan, uh, to the last performance in, in Rome in Italy at the University of Roma, it was a, a nine-year project. And... Um, when uh, John O'Flaherty died, um, his wife reached out to me and said, I know you and John were very close. I wanted you to know he passed. Um, and it's online. I hadn't really thought of mentioning this here, but these, this show, Watertown's online. I think it's at YouTube. But uh, So that one, okay? And then the other one that people kind of light up about is Abundance, a project about America and money. And for that, I interviewed about 30, 35 multimillionaires around the country and the same number of minimum wage workers in the same city. Seven performance spaces had commissioned and leaders had commissioned this project. And the, so they did an amazing job bringing people together uh, for these mixed economic, mixed income, mixed economic resource dialogues. And... Uh, <clears throat> I've had experiences living close to the bone, some of my community, my friends have had as well. So I got to have, you know, my own perspective, all this, but uh, there were so many things that I was finding confusing was kind of where this performance came out of. Uh, poverty rates in most cities were exceeding 25%, 25% poverty rate mm. in cities, in New Haven in Burlington, in New York City, in Houston. These are the places that Seattle, that, that the show came and, and was performed. So, and then yet all around me, I would see people who had, you know, expensive homes, went on vacation. I couldn't figure out like, and the landscape has truly uh, changed dynamically since then. This was, I started that project in 98 and, uh, and it, finished in 2004 in the last performance in Philly. But uh, but three of the questions I asked the multi, well, I asked a lot of people, but three of them were, there were nine questions. What is enough? What would be enough for you? What is a lie you tell yourself about money? And then after the nine questions, the last one was, what would change for you personally if you knew from this moment on when I finish asking this question, um, everyone everywhere would always have enough. Yeah. What's the one thing that would change in your life that comes to mind if you knew when I finished asking you this question, everyone everywhere would always have enough. And I get a little teary every time I get to this part of sharing some about that project because it turned out over 70% of the people without knowing, this is 5,000 people, rough estimate, but not at all padded. Um, 5,000 people over all those years that I got to hear from and answer that question. Over 70% of them said they would make some form of art. I've always wanted to learn the clarinet. Oh, I used to write poetry. Oh, I 
I, I would love to learn to watercolors. I would, I, I would love to join a chorus, right? And I, it took me a long time to realize what I was hearing and that this, that the, the dread and way we have to not look at economic inequity to just get through our lives or the way we feel like we have to not look, those of us who aren't looking or trying not to look, um, that what that is sitting on is our, it's intricately connected to our impulse to be creative. So, um, wow. in yeah. the end, five actor equities actors played about 20 roles in the play I wrote. Uh, Steve Bailey helped direct it, co-directed it with me. And um, we toured the seven cities. And I'll just say the last thing, at the end of a 90 minute play, which then was like a 90 minute play, oh my God. But anyway, uh, now not so much. Um, but the audience, like again, like most of the audience stayed for another hour, I kid you not to talk about money. I would come out, the actors weren't interested. I would come out and we would just spend another hour together, sometimes in the lobby, sometimes in the theater. And I would figure out ways they can talk to each other and have listening exchanges if possible. Um, but that's how hungry, how desperate we were mm -hmm. to talk. Um, I'm sure I'm using up too much time, but- No, I'm, so, I'm, I'm really so taken with everything you're sharing and with everything you are about. And I'm just thinking as I'm listening, uh, and I am familiar with your work, uh, not all of it. I wish I was familiar with absolutely everything and that I had seen absolutely everything, but I am familiar with your work. And I'm thinking that there's such an urgency. There's such an urgency with the projects that you, that you develop. They really speak to the moments that we're in. Um, and they also involve, in terms of participants and also audience members, if people who are less typical than coming, if there is such a thing, right? You know, less typical audiences. And so, um, I think that everything that you're sharing is really, it's really beautiful and really, really significant. And um, what are you focused on now? Can you? Can you share what um, I have? I made it a short list. Um, I did. Uh, you, I knew you were going to ask me. I guess <laughs> I guess what you were going to ask me. Uh, I'll say it short and then I'll say the three ideas or four ideas I came up with. Because the projects, who knows if anything, I'm either thinking too big or I don't know what's going on. But uh, Main USA, seasonal performance, major 120 community members and professional actors in the cast, music, everything. The history of Maine from the Ice Age till now with a, a right whale full-size puppet. It's, you know, it's to let, to re help reset the narrative of who we are beginning with 13,000 years ago in Wabanaki, indigenous people of Maine here they're working with me on it. They were as a board members, as dramaturgs. Anyway, that big tent, you know, I got some support, but nothing like what that big idea is going to need. So then I have a small version with three young people called Everything USA, which again, I'm hoping to, to see that happen. And there's three working class men who sing songs by a, a pickup truck that's idling during the performance. And it would be outside in part during COVID, but there's also a perfect place for it to be outside here mm -hmm. in uh, near where I live. And uh, and then Planet E Mini Golf. Uh, yes, Mini Golf, which I've never been a big fan, but I'm trying, I was trying to think of something that working class people, all people could feel like it was theirs and could again, literally be happen on common ground, cross a lot of the partisan ship that we certainly have in Maine and certainly is all over the country at this point. Um, and it's based on the climate crisis, but in a kind of joyful, expansive 
communicative way. So one hole, you don't use your putter or your your putter, your ball, you sit and tell a story about a tree that's made a difference to you in your life and why, a one-minute story. And if you do that, you get to take points off your score. I know for a lot of people, score is very important, so we'll put that to work. <laughs> Another hole is about trust, and if you want, you can get a more desirable score by putting a blindfold on and having your teammates guide you through the hole. Another hole is... Uh, and then each hole has a relationship to a Wabanaki indigenous, um, uh, that we have two Wabanaki dramaturgs, um, uh, and also, uh, consultants and artists working on it. Each hole will be designed by a different artist in Maine. Uh, we have some amazing artists who've signed up already, who've agreed. But again, these are big projects. They cost a lot of money. And, uh, so we'll see. We'll see. And then the last one is definitely doable. It's Fairy Village. I live in a, a neighborhood called Fairy Village, and we've got lots of partisanship, lots of increasing diversity, and um, it's a chance for people to tell a story, to take this relatively small neighborhood and with a long history and people, the Boys and Girls Club is in it, the Coast Guard's a partner, the Knitting Nook, the bar, the working class bar is uh, is a part of it. And each one is going to have their own little evening where people have taken a picture of someplace in the neighborhood they care about and why, a person in the neighborhood that they wanted to take a picture of and why, and a photo, of, you know, cell phone photo from inside where they live and why they took that one. So we're going to work on storytelling. We're going to work on photography things, just brief and very uh, user friendly. And then have a slideshow. This is one of the projects I did with the neighborhoods. It was very successful. It's very like low, high impact, low uh, entry. And so we'll do that. And then we're going to have, we have a beautiful park here and we'll have a big screen uh, probably in October and have invite the community to come and have like 10 of the folks share their thing and all get together. So that is it. And the ideas I've been keen on exploring and believe me, exploring is the byword because I haven't, I don't have any follow up ideas, but um, is what is creativity's resonance, art making's resonance with permaculture, restorative justice and regenerative agriculture so those are all on like a serious back burner but that kind of the chance to think about that stuff is exciting to me but what there's a lot mean? of themes that are running through your work as you're talking it was about the environment many years ago when you did this big water project yes and it has always looked at economic inequity in class and honoring working class people. As, you know, as you talk, I see all the tributaries of your river. Nice. And all the themes. Um, I think it's great to start small and then say, oh my goodness, this really has expansive possibilities. But the other possibility is we start big <laughs> and then we scale back. You know, right. as long as we're doing the work, yeah. we're doing the work. And I guess maybe um, we could talk with you for a really long time, but I, I guess maybe in conclusion, what I'm wondering is if you could share with us, Marty, how you got involved with community-based work as an artist, because you were a carpenter, right? So can you share? Yeah, I was, a, I was a carpenter. No, no, I'm going to I'm I'm have a whole chapter in a book called Sisters in the Brotherhood, uh, being one of the organizers and activists getting people of color and women in the trades the construction trades in new york city so that was definitely a part of my life um very much and yes a carpenter but uh so so how did i become involved in community arts um um you recall pardon i said do you recall yes i think i do okay. uh in 1975, I'm trying to hit the high points here. In 1975, I saved up money. I was a taxi cab driver in St. Pete, Florida, worked a graveyard shift, earned almost nothing. Somehow I saved up the $1,000 and went to Sagaris, this radical feminist institute, the first of its kind of that kind of thing in 1977. 
75. Yes. And so then for two years, and, and we had the, one of the first lesbian mother custody cases, and we raised money. We did a, an evening to raise money for this woman from Minneapolis to even get home and try to fight to get her kids back. Her husband had taken her kids. She found all this out. And um, somehow, Joan, I realized, and people were fighting, women, we were fighting with each other, very fierce, very fierce. Um, and it got really out of control the next session, but uh, our session managed to make it to the end. And I realized that I'd been scared of improvisational work and never really done it willingly, that's for sure, uh, my whole life. But I made up a show. I made up like a 10-minute performance about the fighting. And I realized that that place that gets created in performance is unlike any other. And that people, the way I describe it usually is I say there's no off switch. It's, it's the most pain, when it's not going well, it's the most painful place you could be is a performance yes. not going well. Yes. Um, and that showed me how powerful it was. That was kind of how I came to it. So anyway, uh, these improvisational performances I did around the country to women audiences. So I was kind of performing for a community and then they got, I was too well received or too, and I received positive attention. And I realized just personally, I wasn't in shape to, to, to handle all that. So I stopped for 10 years and just did, you know, more traditional activism. Um, but when I turned 35, I, uh, I asked myself what, what, it was a big age for me. I tried to kill myself a lot growing up and at so 20, I decided to stop and wait till I was 35. And then if I still wanted to kill myself at 35, go ahead. And so I had this kind of lovely 15 year hiatus. So 35 came and I believe me, I remembered my promise at 20. And I realized not only did I not want to kill myself, um, but I needed to perform and I'm not sure how that connection was made. So that's when I started, um, doing performances again. What first was, oh, the wonder of it all, then what it's like to be a man. I wanted to take all the powerful experiences and information I'd gotten from being in the women's movement, being in CR movements, um, going to conferences, all that examination of us as a gender and apply it to men who I'd worked with as, in construction and obviously grown up with. And uh, it had been a very, rough experience and yet somehow my love stayed intact with uh with men and uh a seasoned love we'll say and so i did a show i interviewed 60 men boys all races and backgrounds and ages and asked them a lot of powerful questions that no one obviously had asked them and what do they love about being a man what do they hate what can't they stand about other men what do they love about other men what's a time with their dad that they'll never forget and uh, and did a one woman show about it, and that was the second show I did. So, the kind of asking questions has always been a part of my work. Bringing in other people for a sense of what mm -hmm. is out there and where are we, and then figuring out a way to add that all together, and also add my own thinking uh and and take on things so um that's 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 amazing you know to think that uh it, it sort of circles back to what you were saying that people said if if money was no object what would they do right that there was this font of creativity in you and it was your own exploration of creativity that it sounds like it it gave you a lifeline yeah, that it, it made you feel hopeful about staying here, staying on the planet. Yeah, in the skin that you are being in the life that you are, yeah, in the body that you are just yeah, as a living sentient being is what I mean. Um, Agreed. Uh, uh, that the that the art that you engage with gave that gift to you. Yeah. And then that led to working in larger ways with community. Yeah, right. Very That's, much so. I did not know some of this history about you. Um, um, it makes me sad to hear that you uh, suffered as you did. Oh yeah, but you know, right? 
and then yeah. you, you you had feelings of, of suicidal uh, feelings. Um, I hope that that's not where you're at anymore. That is not. No, no. You'll have oh, to drag yeah. me out. I did a performance in New York once. Like, you know, we, we had Dixon Place back then, and we'd have, like, these little nights. And one of my performances, the... The, the title was almost longer than the performance lasted, but it was, the title of the performance was, they tried to throw me out of society, but I wouldn't let go of the door molding. <laughs> I love it. And there's a kind of joy and hopefulness that I'm hearing Correct. Correct. about you. And I think these are very, very hard times as we started out, uh, but there's a joy in creating. There's a joy in making work with community it, it just leads to a sense of hope i feel um absolutely but i actually think the ground the the this burgeoning movement that the educators who who may or may not hear this um that like one thing i i feel like let's not teach that there's a right way and a wrong way let's not teach the rules um let's encourage people to think as expansively and intimately as they can. Um, obviously there's ethics involved in doing this work, but I do think I'm, my hope, and I might put $10 on it, is that this mixing of creativity and creative engagement with communities may be the terrain upon which we actually succeed in turning the tide. Um, you know, data isn't gonna make it isn't done it. Films haven't done it. Books haven't done it. They've all made a difference. Policies haven't done it. COPs haven't done it, right? Um, what's, where are people going to get, be willing to take to find the courage to be as disruptive and as disobedient and as risking everything that obviously needs to happen and happen soon? And uh, I do think there's nothing, there's nothing in reality that matches what things are possible in a room where creativity is happening. You can ask people questions you'd never ask them. Who would ask those men those questions, right? That's not a question you just ask, and yet you can, you know. And uh, that's that's the land that we get to. Ex continue exploring. Right. And story takes us places that David never takes us. Right. But I personally feel that change is about several strands coming together. I think it is about story sharing. I also think it's about public policy. And yes. Obviously, it's about legislation, given everything yes. that's going on. But story is a window into something else. Right. And it, it's a human element and hopefully a non-human element um, that that connects these things, right? Right. Um, so, uh, and well, we did, we did good, we did it. We did it, we did good. I want to thank you. I want to thank you for the extraordinary work that you're doing in the world. It's, uh, you're doing work that's that's really really important and you have your own unique voice and take on things that then brings other people into this process and uh i think that you are so deserving of this award that we are very very pleased to be giving to Thank you. you uh and um we look forward to honoring you some more and glad that a lot of people are going to be able to see this video and and tell them your website before we leave Oh, right. That's good. Yes. If we should add some things. Yeah, the TED Talk is on YouTube. It's on our artatwork.us site. Yeah, that's good. And there's a martypottinger.com site that needs work. So. <laughs> it's got stuff. The other one doesn't have it. but Most of our websites are, are needing updates to try and keep Yeah, yeah. Is. Where are those people? Right. <laughs> we're, we're busy it's great to be with you. Yes. Thanks, yes. everybody, for paying attention. It's a pleasure. So thank you so much, Marty. Yep. Take care. To be continued.